I am so excited to be here this morning and I'm so excited to see all your guys' faces. It is so exciting to be back in this building again. And I am Ayape Nicholas, and I've been going by Pastor Ayape in the last couple of months. And I have been a pastoral intern here at Bethesda for the winter. I am so excited to be here with you all. Oh, you guys can sit, sorry. <laughs> no, you guys have to stand the whole time I'm talking because I am standing. <laughs> I am so grateful for the opportunity that you guys have given me to be an intern here um, this winter. And I wanna thank you and I wanna take some time on this, my last Sunday to thank you. I have felt so welcomed in this church in the last year and a half and especially over the last three months. So I wanted to take some time and just say thank you. Each one of you for everything that you have allowed me to do and everything that you have allowed me to become. And I had to check before I came up here that this was actually still morning because I have a habit of saying good morning in the afternoon and in the evening and sometimes at night. That, <laughs> we'll get in there. <laughs> so I used to work overnights at, at a fast food restaurant. I worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And my brain, just like everyone else's brain, is used to saying things at certain times of the day. If you start saying good afternoon in the afternoon, Sometimes we find ourselves saying it into the evening, or we say, uh, good morning, sometimes it's afternoon, or good night, it's morning for me, apparently. Because when I worked overnight, my morning was your guys' nights, and my nights were your guys' mornings. And so while other people's days were starting at 7 a.m., and my night was ending at 11 p.m., the other way around, my night was starting at 11, my morning was starting at 11 p.m., and your day was ending and my night was beginning at 7 a.m. and your morning was ending. It was your other way. Yes. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. So in the morning, I was saying good night to people. I was saying, have a good night as they were going to work. They're passing through the drive-thru. I'm passing them their coffee. And I'm saying, good night, guys. And they're like, it's, it's my morning. And I'm saying, I'm getting ready for bed. I'm going, I'm going to bed. And nighttime, I would say, good morning. I'd walk into my work, and I'd be like, oh, good morning, guys. And everyone would look at me like, what are you doing? Like, it's obviously not nighttime. It became such a pattern that my dad actually at night would say good morning when I woke up at, at supper time or dinner. And in the morning when I'd come home and he dropped me off at work before I'd go to bed, he'd say good night because I said it that frequently. My brain took control of this apathetic rhythm. I didn't, did, wasn't really thinking. When you wake up in the morning, your brain immediately says it's morning. And so I was waking up at night and thinking it was morning, even though literally I knew I could see it was dark outside. I knew it was nighttime, but that didn't stop the fact that my brain wanted to follow this apathetic, this unaware rhythm. And people would look at me really funny and they would laugh at me and I would laugh with them most times because it was just so funny that nighttime I would say good morning and it was clearly 11 p.m. Like people are going to bed. I go to bed before 11 p.m. now and I'm here like good morning at 11 p.m. And so I compare this rhythm to a, the color gray. Gray is a neutral color, you know. Most times you're not drawn to this gray color. You don't get excited when you look at gray unless you're painting your house and then you get excited because you found the perfect gray. But we, we, it's a boring, it's eye-catching. We often, uh, we don't even notice the color gray. And if habits had a color, I would like to call this habit a gray habit, a gray area of rhythm. Because I really did not, was not aware of what I was saying. Unless someone pointed it out or laughed at me, which happened a lot, like I said, I ignored it. It was gray, it was boring, it did not have any color or life. And I'm sure that together we all have these different gray and apathetic rhythms. I'm positive that there are things in your life that you do without even thinking about. If it be brushing your teeth immediately or after you eat, or saying hello in, when you greet somebody and goodbye when you're saying see you later. These are apathetic gray rhythms that our brain takes control of. And throughout this series, we've been refocusing and rebuilding and reclaiming these long-standing rhythms that bring health and, and God's blessings into our everyday lives. And so as we rebuild these habits of going out to places and going to church and going to volunteering and giving, 
It's important that we step out of some of these gray areas because I know it has been a habit to click online and, and watch online. And now that we're coming back in the church, we need to forcibly bring ourselves out of these areas and re-embrace the color and the life that they can give into these areas. For two years, some of the previously important habits have been at times taken away from us and we have had to compromise and change. These gray areas have now become apathetic habits and I want to focus on the habit today of loving in action as we reflect on the Last Supper. To be clear, I'm not saying right now that we have not loved in the last two years because corporately even there is evidence that we have loved as a church. We had the big give last year, and we had, we had the four event last year where we gave bread to our neighbors, and we had so much more, and over Christmas we were able to donate so much. We have loved, but I want to encourage you to implement and re-implement loving in action every single day into your lives to take it from a gray area habit and bring new color and new life into it. And so, as most of you guys are probably aware, there are four accounts of the gospel. There are four stories of the life of Christ in the New Testament, and each book represents and presents a whole picture of the life of Christ. When we put them together, we have this beautiful story. We can see from beginning to end different details that are so crucial and important and even reflect back on the Old Testament. Likewise, there are four gospel accounts of the Last Supper. And the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe this event differently than John does a little bit. And John includes things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke exclude, and likewise, Matthew, Mark, and Luke exclude some things that John doesn't. I want to reflect on this whole, these, all these pieces together and put them together like a puzzle because we learn information from John that we do not get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I want to look at this as a whole story, not just as one individual thing or another. So we're gonna look at it together, but first I wanna recap what's going on in this time right now. So right now, Jesus and the disciples are celebrating the Passover festival and they are near Bethany. They're just outside the city, it says, on the day of unleavened bread. And Matthew chapter 26 tells us that in Bethany, Jesus has been teaching and doing great works. He's been anointed, he has raised from the dead, and the chief priests and the teachers are very upset with him. They're annoyed, is what I like to say. They're rolling their eyes at him a little bit, and they're trying to find a way to get rid of him because he had really, really bothered them. And one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, goes to the leaders and decides to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And so as part of the celebrations of Passover, Jesus sends two of his disciples into Bethany. And in in Bethany, they say, go find a man, and you're going to celebrate our Passover with him in his building, and there's going to be preparations there. And so he sends these people to go prepare for Bethany. And at this point, in all the chapters of the Last Supper, the storyline shifts. And together now, we see something for the first time that John has included that the rest of them have excluded. And I love this part. And so we're going to turn to John chapter 13, 3 to 7. And if you guys have your word, I'll give you a moment to pull that out too. And so here again, we are celebrating the Passover with Jesus' disciples. And in this situation, Jesus gets up and he washes the disciples' feet. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things underneath his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and he took off his outer garments And he wrapped up in a towel and ran his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drawing them with the towel that he had around his waist. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but you later you will understand. And so here Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. (laughs) We're going to pause here. Jesus, their teacher, their leader, their friend, steps down from a position of leadership into a slave's position. From a position of leadership to a slave's position. And first, I want to say something here. I'm going to give you context. In Luke's account, he includes something as well. The disciples at the Last Supper are disagreeing over who is the greatest and who is the least. 
they're, they're arguing, they're squabbling, kind of pictures me and my little sister when we were arguing back and forth, like, I'm better than you are. This is what I'm thinking, this is what it's like. I'm sure if your parents, your sibling, your children have done this too. And so here we are in the Last Supper and we see this, this squabbling over who is the greatest and the least, and this should set the tone for why Jesus does what he does. He does it not because he feels that he has to wash their feet, but because he wants to show them an example of what his love is and what love truly is. And so second, I want to make note of this, washing feet would have been a servant's job. And I said that a moment ago, but this celebration was private. There was just likely the 12 and Jesus in this room, and there was no servants. It was the Passover. The city was full of life and celebration. Their, their feet would have been really dirty and gross. And there was no one to wash their feet. And now the disciples are arguing over who is the greatest and who is the least. And obviously they are not about to submit to one another and admit to their inferiority. And so here we are, and Jesus is understanding this. And he steps down from his position of authority into his servant's position, and he leads from it. Let me repeat that one more time. He steps down from a position of authority into a servant's position, the lowest of the low, and he leads from it. He humbly did that. Let's go back over to John 13, and we're going to look at um, verses 14 to 16 this time. Now that I, your Lord Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. For I have shown you, uh, wash one another's feet, I, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, there is no one greater, no servant greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. He tells us here that there is no greater and no least. Here, Jesus represents to the disciples the importance of serving others despite our status. One author phrased this, and I really like this, as a voluntary humiliation to rebuke pride and then as an action of humility and love. A voluntary humiliation. Jesus, their leader, voluntarily steps out of this position of leadership into the lowest of low positions. And in an act of love, he shows them this concept of love in action. And he gets down and he washes their dirty feet and leads from this position. And after he has done this, the meal and the other accounts has progressed. And so in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he talks about Judas' betrayal here. And then he goes on to the cup and the bread. And I want to read from a portion of this meal too because it's an important factor as well. In Matthew chapter 26, 26 to 29, and I'll give you another moment to turn to it because you don't have it tabbed like I do. So it says here, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said to his disciples, take this and eat my body. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. This is the covenant which poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this wine, vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's stop here again. I want to give you some context about what's happening here as well. In this time, this cup and bread was not a traditional part of the Passover. There were four cups. This was not one of them. Jesus adds this quite shocking addition, and the disciples are probably like, what is going on? But in this shocking addition, Jesus makes very clear something, that he is going to sacrifice himself, and he reflects on the events that are to come. And at this point, Jesus knows that the time is coming for him to fulfill his purpose. In this, his last meal, he takes time to to explain to his friends again the symbolism behind what is about to happen, and the forgiveness that he brings, the freedom that accompanies his love. Jesus loved so hard, so much, that he died 
and was willing to be a sacrifice as an answer to our failures and our weaknesses and our sins. He shows us the importance in this symbolism of acting from love, from, from, and he acts from the love of the Father here, God the Father, and from his own love as he endeavors to bring our salvation. Another very clear example of love in action. So after they have eaten together, Jesus explains how he's bringing forth this new covenant. And each of the accounts include additional three events. And one of these events is Peter's denial. Now, I, I have phrased it, Peter's predicted denial. I had to say it really slow because for sure you'd slip up on that. Imagine saying that 10 times fast. Peter's predicted denial. I couldn't do it, no. And so in Peter's denial, we are given this new commandment that Jesus gives to the disciples. And we see that in John 13 again. And that's 34 to 35. And this one says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's stop here again. I mean, this like makes me like, my spirit jumps for joy when I read this, because we see again that a third time in this story, beautiful, by the way, three times, three points, Amazing, fits perfectly into a sermon plan. This concept of love in action in the story of the Last Supper. And here we are, talked, we are told by Jesus that we are to love one another. Not only to love one another, but to love one another as he has loved us. And so he's telling the disciples this, and he's instructing them. And I want to tell you what this love means. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love willing to give up everything for somebody else. It's a love that rejects position. It's not interested in rank. It edifies, it educates. It forgives all. And it reflects God's own character. And that's only what we learn right here in this story. There's so much more that, that Jesus' love is throughout the Gospels. But right here in these four chapters, that's all we learn right here. And he commands us to live this kind of love. That's a lot of kind of loves. For a final time, I want to recap the events for you of what we just seen in the Last Supper. And so we know that Jesus and the disciples have been in Bethany, and they're celebrating now the Passover Supper. And together, they're, they're, they're together, and Jesus has shown love in action as he washed the disciples' feet. And Jesus has explained how he's going to bring forth a new co covenant from love, God's love. And they, and they sing and they head to the Mount of Olives without Judas. And here Jesus predicts Peter's denial. And then they receive a new commandment to love. So we have in love, from love, and to love. In these chapters, Jesus acts in his love. He acts from love and he leads the disciples to love. Jesus acts in love by washing the disciples' feet. And I think that that's one of the most profound things. And then he acts from love by bringing a new covenant, which, man, I could cry just thinking about. And he leads the disciples to love in this new commandment. And we're given these instructions to live like this and to love like this. And as we've been focusing on rebuilding in the last few seasons, the last few weeks, and reclaiming these long-standing rhythms that bring health and God's blessings to our everyday lives. We've been rebuilding our old habits of going to church on a Sunday or giving or volunteering. And as we, we, we rebuild these rhythms, it's important that we remember that there is a rhythm of love that we need to focus on too. With restrictions and isolations, it's been challenging to love others, isn't, has it not been? It's been hard to volunteer and to serve when you're, you're filled with fear. It's been hard to, to go to your neighbor's house and drop off something because you're not sure if they're gonna be comfortable with receiving a gift from you. It's been a challenge. But as we return to our new normal, which I'm sure we're all tired of hearing, and begin to rebuild, it's important to purposely consider what love in action should look like. And we should use Jesus' example in the Last Supper for that. It's a love that serves others and rejects position. 
It's a love that brings worth and value to the person who is receiving it. And I want to touch on that for a second. When you love like Jesus loves, you are bringing value into somebody. If you're leading from a servant's position, you are bringing value into somebody. They believe, they're learning that they're not only loved, but they are worthy of it. It's a kind of love that sacrifices. It's a kind of love that people deserve. It's a kind of love that represents our love for God and acts out of our love for him. It's a love that not only serves people, but serves God, and it gives him the glory. It's a love that Christ represented throughout the Gospels and as he died on that cross. It's a love in action that requires nothing but gives every single thing. As we act, we should be careful to act like Christ. We need to act in love and from love and to love others. This type of love requires purposeful decision-making to wake up in the day and decide that you are going to love others. You are going to look for the opportunities to serve and to love from God and to love like God. It prioritizes others and your relationships with them. It builds up worth and community. I'm a big person for worth. I think everyone should know their worth because you are created in the image of God and that means you are a wonderful creation. And so this kind of love gives these people this idea of this love that they are supposed to be receiving. When we show people this kind of love, we give them worth. We let them know that not only are they love and they are worthy, but they are created in the image of God, our Father, and that means they are perfect in their own way. This kind of love brings life to others, but also to ourselves. We receive things from this kind of love. I firmly believe that this kind of love brings about a reaction. And I don't know if any of you guys have any knowledge on physics. I have very little. But I do know that there are three laws. And there are three laws of motion. And one of the laws of motion says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For every single action, there is an equal and opposite reaction reaction. It's a law, which means it's been proven. This kind of love and action is not only having an effect on others, but it has an effect on us too. This kind of love can be done in very many different actions. It doesn't require one set kind of love. It's kind of love that strengthens our relationship with others and our relationship with God. This kind of love can be washing the dishes for your mom or your dad or your wife when they are tired. It could be shoveling your neighbor's driveway when they seem to be overwhelmed with the load. It could be offering to use your gift, maybe you're good at listening or praying or maybe you're great at cooking or hospitality to serve someone else. It could be greeting people in the church foyer. Yeah, it's just as simple as that saying hello in the morning to make people know that they are seen and they are worth something. It could be giving up a fast food meal and saving that $10 or $20 and putting it into the offering when we do a missions offering or when we're we're doing our regular offering so we can continue to support the ministries that are furthering God's love in the church. And that's just a handful of examples. There are so many more Here at Bethesda, there is a wide variety of things that you can serve within. And we love having people serve. And if you're looking for, to get back in this habit of loving others as Christ loved us, loving, loving, acting in love and acting from love and, and acting to love others, we need to look that we are We can look towards our church, and our church has many areas of ministry you can volunteer in. If your gift is cooking, there is places for you here too. If your gift is hospitality, there is places. If your gift is relating well, there are people to relate with. And so you can find our volunteer application on their website if you would like to volunteer, or you can connect with one of our pastors. And I'll put a little plug in. You can text SERVE to 709-701-3336. 
Clearly, my supervisor has had an impact on me because she likes to use that number. <laughs> As disciples of Jesus, we cannot afford to let this type of love and action go to waste. We cannot afford for it to be a gray area in our lives. We cannot afford to be apathetic about it. Because we've been command- commanded to love one another. And I'm just realizing that I forgot to tell the band they can come back. You can come back, band. So let's be careful to be sure that we love one another and be sure that we act from this love of God, that we take a time to be like Jesus, that we get down and we wash someone's feet. Of course, I wouldn't do it literally because I think feet are gross. (laughs) But there are other ways to serve. Let's not let this love be like my... 11 p.m., good morning. That, that, let's, let's let this love be like a thing that we put purposely in our lives to add color and warmth and brightness. To love God and to love others and have this love in action that we can receive from and there are blessings that come from it. I'm going to pray as we conclude and I want to leave you guys knowing that you know, you're called to love like this. And I received this message when I couldn't sleep from the Holy Spirit and I couldn't wait to get it on paper and I couldn't put it out fast enough. Because the Bible in the Last Supper tells us one, a lot of things and in the full picture we see it. We are to love in action. And he wants us to love. All right. Dear God, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to meet here together today. I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak your word to these people, and I pray that you have helped it permeate their hearts, that in this seat today and in, on the stage today and in the homes today, as we're listening or we're watching, we're getting this new courage and this new uh, confidence and this new excitement to lead in love, to act in love, to bring your love to people around us. Help us to show love in the little things. Help us to show love in the big things and in the in-between, God. Help us to let us be love, your love here on earth. Dear God, I pray that your love will touch the lives of people who are suffering right now, that your love will begin to, hurt, to help the hurting hearts and they'll mend it, God, because your love is powerful. And I pray all these things knowing that you died on the cross this Easter, that Easter season to love us. And I'm so grateful for this day and every day that I get the opportunity to share and to show your love. Amen.